Well, good evening. Uh, as Mar said, my name is Dan, and our talk for tonight is Why Did Jesus Die? And as with every other week, we went out onto the streets and asked uh, and canvassed opinion on people uh, on that question. Let's have a look. Uh, um, I have no idea. Why did Jesus die? Je- did Jesus, I should really know this. Big question for early in the morning, isn't it? Jesus died for people, other people. He's saving us. Was it Pontius Pilate probably got a bit jealous of Jesus getting all the birds, so... We all die. People die for different reasons. Uh, t- well, it, it, I think it was supposed to be like for our sins, wasn't it? Jesus died because people didn't agree with him. Well, probably fear is why he died more than anything else. Didn't he like sacrifice himself on the cross. So, it was his choice. Jesus died because of people's beliefs. That's up for discussion. Everybody dies. No one lives forever. What do the following people have in common? Wayne Rooney, Justin Bieber, Jay-Z, Madonna, and the Pope. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, doesn't it? Uh, There may be many answers, of course, but one of the things that they all share in common is that they all wear a cross. Now, of course, there's uh, many people here maybe wearing a cross in a necklace or a lapel or maybe even a tattoo, and there's nothing wrong with that. But have you ever stopped to think that that's slightly odd, that we would wear something that is actually a form of execution? How would you have felt if I had greeted you tonight wearing this rather snazzy gallows necklace. Or maybe if I had some electric chair cufflinks or some lethal injection earrings. How would that have made you feel? The cross was a form of execution. A form of execution so brutal that even the Romans eventually abolished it in 337 AD. Uh, So why do people wear a cross? Well, the cross, if you like, is the symbol of Christianity. It's like its logo. About a third of the stories of Jesus' life are about his death on the cross. Much of the rest of the New Testament is trying to explain why Jesus died. The central service of the church, communion or the Eucharist, is celebrating his death and resurrection. But why? You know, for many people, they are remembered for their lives, not their deaths. The uh, 19th century statesman Li Hong Jiang said this, why would you worship Christ? Why that man's life was a failure and he was actually crucified at the end of it. Why did people follow him? Why did Jesus die? What did it achieve? This is a question that's run down through the ages. Time magazine uh, asked this on its front cover a few years ago. Why did he die? Why is it relevant to me? Well, the New Testament's answer is this, that Jesus died for you and for me. But what on earth does that mean? And how can that be relevant to me 2,000 years later? In the book of John, this, uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, possibly one of the most famous verses of the Bible, in some ways sums up the entire message of the Bible. It's, this is written. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The answer from the New Testament is why did Jesus die? Is because God loves you. God loves you. You are an amazing person. You were created in the image of God. Sometimes people will say, well, I know somebody who's not a Christian, and they're pretty awesome. They're pretty amazing. Is that surprising? And the answer is, of course not. Every person, no matter what belief or or what other distinguishing features they have, is made in the image of God. And uh, people who are Christians are no better than anybody else, although they're hopefully becoming better than they were before. So you're created in the image of God. But there's another side to the coin isn't there? Certainly in my own life, I'd have to admit, there are some things that I occasionally do that I'm not entirely proud of. Uh, In the book of Romans, uh, this is written, 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible uses this word sin. Now the problem with this word is that today it's, it's been associated with religious repression or adverts for luxury chocolate lingerie or ice cream. It's, uh, it's come, become synonymous, if you like, with enjoyable naughtiness. The idea that someone somewhere, possibly your granny, would be deeply disapproving of what you might be doing. But putting those caricatures to, to one side... We have to face up to it that we all do things we're not entirely proud of. We all do things that maybe we'd rather other people didn't know about. And I'm not just talking about things that we do by accident. It's our seemingly natural inclination to break things, to break relationships, to break moods, to break break promises. Uh, And it's not even just the rules that are outside of us, like moral or legal rules. We don't even keep our own rules. You know, I don't exercise three times a week. I eat food that's bad for me. I say mean things, feel sorry about it, and then say them again. It's It's been reported in the news this week that a third of vegetarians admit that when they've had a little bit too much to drink on a night out with friends, will eat meat. We don't even keep our own rules, let alone the rules outside of us. And it's hard to admit, isn't it? Certainly to a group of strangers. Uh, But, you know, I find it so hard to admit that I ever do anything wrong. Those words just get stuck in my throat, even though it's so obvious. And I'm always trying to find someone else to blame. And it's normally the people closest to me, normally my wife. Yingwei Wada Taita. I came across some of these things that some people have sent to their insurance companies, uh, trying to come up with reasons why an accident they were involved with was not their fault. One man wrote this, going home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that was not there. Another wrote, I had no idea I was speeding as I can't read the speedometer because I'm dyslexic. Another wrote this, the pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. But we've all done things that are wrong. In the Bible's words, we've all sinned. But what does that mean? Well, some people say, well, I've lived a good life. But I suppose it depends who we're comparing ourselves to. There are so many different standards. It's like other areas of life, isn't it? Sporting, uh, sporting achievements, or, or I study music, as Miles said. And the reason I got good at music was in my class at school, uh, most of the others weren't that very good at p- playing the piano. And I could sort of stab out some chords with one hand and uh, bash away a tune at the other. So everyone thought I was great. And I was like, yes, I am. And so I got a little bit better. But then I discovered there were older people in the school who were better. And so I had to practice harder to get better. And then I got to a county level music group and realized there were people even better so I had to practice even harder. And then I got to university and you get all the Asian students come and they just take it to a whole nother level. <laughs> there are just so many different standards. And it's like that in the moral, in the spiritual world. I've heard it expla- uh, explained like this. You know, some people say, well, I have no need for Jesus. I live a good life. But, but suppose here we had a scale of human goodness. Like at the bottom... Just move Leon's guitar. Say at the bottom, we had the worst person. The worst person that ever lived. Say, we'll say at the bottom, we'll put somebody like Hitler. I'll go down there. And then the top, this is the top end of the scale of human goodness. We put, say, one of the best people that ever lived. Maybe Mother Teresa of Calcutta. We'll put her up there. Now, the question is, where would we put me? Where do we put Dan? Come on, shout out your answers. Well, we'll start in the middle. Where? Lower, lower, lower. Higher, higher, higher. Above Mother Teresa. You're so kind. Um, I'm going to put myself slightly below the middle. I'm going to be slightly humble. But the question is, what's the standard? You know, it, it, perhaps the standard is these people. Or perhaps it's not the top of that. Perhaps it's the ceiling. But if we look at that verse, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. The standard isn't the ceiling. The standard is the sky or beyond because the glory of God, as we looked at last week, was revealed in Jesus. And compared to him, we all fall a long way short. Well, someone might say, well, if that's the case, then we're all in the same boat. So what does it matter? Well, it does matter because there are consequences. 
And they can be summarized under four headings. The first one uh, is the pollution of sin. The pollution of the environment is uh, an obvious problem. We're we're aware of the haze in the city that's come back, made its return again recently. But what Jesus said is in the same way, it's possible to pollute our souls. That the things that we do, the things that come out of our hearts, that come out of our mouths, they can spoil things. They can pollute our relationships. They can mess things up. And they can also mess our relationship with God up. So there's the pollution of sin. And then there's the power of sin. Jesus said, whoever sins is a slave of sin. Sin is addictive. It, it, it's, it gets its way in so that we, it, we aren't as free as we might think we are. A, a friend of mine called Johnny came up with this brilliant definition of addiction. He had just discovered for the first time ever, Krispy Kreme Donuts. I don't know if you've ever had them. And he, this is the way he described them. He said, they, they make you phys- feel physically sick, but in a way that makes you feel that the only way you will feel better is to have another one. <laughs> what a brilliant definition of addiction. Uh, the, the sin, uh, it, it feels that we do these things that don't make us feel good, that hurt one another, but it feels like the only way to feel better is to carry on. And it's not just the obvious things. Jesus said, it's not just drinking drugs. It could also be envy or, or anger or gossip or, or all those other things that can get a grip in our lives. So there's the pollution, the power, and then there's the penalty of sin. Whenever we see something that is wrong, something in our nature cries out for justice, whether it's uh, Children being abused or corruption uh, in government. Something cries out and says, There's sh- somebody should pay. Somebody needs to pay for that. There needs to be justice. And for myself, I find that very easy to say about other people. I find it a lot harder to say about myself. I'm very happy to judge others. I'm uh, maybe a hypocrite, if you like. A trivial example, but in my former, uh, the place I used to work, we'd have a meeting every week, a staff meeting with everybody uh, who worked there. And it was really important. You had to be on time. No KL time, like you you were there on the dot. You had to be, you had to arrive early. Uh, And if you were late, you had to write to our boss or whoever is chairing the meeting and apologize. Now, there would be times where I wasn't on time. Uh, and, uh, and what I would do is I'd get there and I would think, gosh, I'm going to be seen. So I'd, I'd go in through another door and I'd hide my bag somewhere and then try and walk in casually as if I'd just been in the toilet or uh, been on an errand. And then I'd join the back of the meeting and participate and uh, hoping nobody noticed. And then maybe a few moments later, I'd notice somebody come in late, running, slightly sweaty. And I'd think, you're late. <laughs> And then I'd catch myself and think, well, the only reason you noticed them is because they weren't as sly about it as you've been. It's so easy to judge others. St. Paul writes this. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. It's been said that when we point the finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at us. Or here there's four. So there's the pollution, the power, the penalty. And finally, there's the partition of sin. We looked at this verse before. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The word perish there uh, doesn't just mean physical death. It also means a spiritual death, a being cut off from God. You and I were created for a relationship with our Father in heaven. But sin gets in the way of that. It builds a wall in between. It's like when you fall out with somebody. It feels like there's a barrier between you and them. And the stuff that we do against God not only has the power to cut us off now, but it also has the power to cut us off from him eternally. And this, if you like, is the bad news. That we are out of relationship with God. But of course, the very word gospel means good news. Christianity is overwhelmingly good news. And the good news is that God so loved you, so loved us, that he didn't leave us in the situation that we find ourselves in. He did something about it. What did he do? 
Well, he came up with a solution. A solution so amazing. He came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ and died for you and for me. In the book of Peter, it says this. He himself, speaking of Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree. In other words, the cross. So that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. This is what Christian theologians call the self-substitution of God. But what does that mean? In July 1941, a prisoner escaped from the Nazi concentration camp, Auschwitz. And as a reprisal, the Gestapo picked 10 men, completely arbitrarily, to die in a starvation bunker underground. One of the men who was selected to die was a man called Francis Gajanizdek. And as his name was called forward, he cried out, Alas, ah, my poor wife and children, they will never see me again. At this, a Polish man, very unassuming in many ways, stepped forward and said, Look, I am a Catholic priest. I don't have a wife. I don't have any family. I would like to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. The priest was called Maximilian Colby. He was 47 years old and he went in with the others into the starvation bunker to die. He was a remarkable man. Uh, We're told that he uh, he got them all praying and singing hymns and it transformed the atmosphere. In in fact, he was the last one to die uh, and they actually put him to death with an injection of carbolic acid on the 14th of August, 1941. 40 years later, on October 19, uh, 10th of October, 1982, Maximilian Kolbe's death was put into his proper perspective. In the Vatican at St. Peter's Square, uh, in front of a crowd of 150,000, including uh, cardinals, bishops, and archbishops, was that man, Francis Gaginistek. And the Pope described the death of Maximilian Kolbe in these terms. He said, it was a victory like that won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Many years later, when he died, uh, the independent newspaper ran the obituary of Francis Gajanizdek, and it said that he spent the rest of his life going around telling people what Maximilian Kolbe had done for him because he had died in his place. And in an even more amazing way, Jesus died in our place. He endured crucifixion for us. The Roman uh, historian Cicero describes crucifixion as the most cruel and hideous of tortures. Jesus was stripped, he was beaten, and then he was forced to carry his cross up a hillside. Uh, He was then uh, stripped naked and nailed to the cross. He was then raised up and the cross was dropped into a socket in the ground. He was then left uh, in the heat of the day uh, to the scorn and ridicule of the crowd and he hung there in unbearable pain for six hours. It was the the height of pain and the depth of shame. Yet the New Testament doesn't concentrate on the physical agony of Jesus or even the emotional pain of being betrayed by his friends. What it focuses on, because it's unique, you know, many people have suffered in horrific ways, but what was unique to Jesus was the spiritual suffering because he was cut off from his father. He was cut off for us as he carried our sins. Jesus was bearing our guilt, my guilt, on the cross. Guilt is a horrible emotion to bear. And yet on the cross, Jesus carried the entire uh, universe's weight. He was cut off from God for us. In the book of Isaiah, it says this, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Growing up, I struggled to understand this. I I struggled to understand how somebody dying 2,000 years ago could impact my life today. It never just seemed to click. And, And then one day I heard it explained like this with this illustration. The illustration somebody used was this. They said, 
let this hand represent you and me. And, and let this book represent the sins in our life, the things that we do wrong. And what happens is they form a barrier between us and God. And let this hand represent Jesus. And he, has, he, he never sinned. He had an unbroken relationship with his Father in heaven. There was, he, he never did anything wrong. He lived the perfect life. And this verse says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned to our own way. And then it says this, And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, on the cross, the iniquity of us all. On the cross, Jesus was carrying our sin, your sin, my sin, and therefore he was cut off from God. That's why on the cross he cried, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was cut off, not for his sins, but for our sins. But do you see where that leaves us? That leaves us free to have an unbroken relationship with our Father in heaven. Completely free from everything that held us back before. And so what are the results? What does this tell us about the cross? Well, the New Testament says there are lots of different angles to it. But one of them is it shows us just how much God loves us. If you ever have any doubt that God loves you and that he likes you, uh, you can look at the cross and know. Jesus said, greater love has no person than this, and they lay their life down for their friends. The cross tells us that God loves us. It also tells us something about the nature of God. Sometimes people say, well, what about suffering? What about pain? It's probably the biggest, most universal human question. And and there are no easy answers. There are no simple explanations. But what the cross does tell us is that God is not aloof in our suffering. He knows what it's like to suffer. And now he suffers alongside us. He's a God that knows what it's like to go through everything that you go through. The other thing the cross shows us is that evil and death have been defeated. The cross and resurrection, because in one sense it's one event, show that actually evil was defeated. That because the worst thing that could happen to somebody, death on a cross, was not the last word. That Jesus rose again. The worst thing that could happen to somebody was turned into a blessing for the entire world. But what are the results in our life? Well, the New Testament says this. Look, first of all, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that, so that these things would happen in our life. First of all, we see that the pollution is removed. It says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It wipes the slate clean, like when the rain comes and drives the haze away. You you can make a new start tonight. Uh, We we see that not only that, but the the bad stuff, the addictions, the things that grab hold of our life, we can be set free from. The power, the pollution can be removed. I have a friend called Eddie, and Eddie had the dubious title of being the only guy in London that we had to ban from Alpha. Um, We had to ban him because he was consistently disruptive uh, um, uh, on numerous courses. I think we have a photo uh, of Eddie. Uh, This is when we first met Eddie. He was was homeless. He'd had uh, the toughest of lives. And at this stage, he was living in a dumpster. Um, And although he'd been banned from Alpha, somehow he managed to find his way onto the Alpha weekend, the the one that Miles spoke about earlier. Uh, We had this Alpha weekend. Somebody invited him. He he came along. And on this weekend, he heard that God loved him. And he heard that he didn't need to do anything to earn that love. And that Jesus had died for him so that he could be free from the things that were holding him back in his life. Free and find forgiveness for his sins. And so he asked Jesus for forgiveness. He prayed a really simple prayer. It's a prayer that Christians pray a lot. Father, thank you that you love me. I'm sorry for the things that I do that are wrong in my life and ask that you forgive them. 
and I asked that you would come into my life. And on that weekend, Eddie decided to follow Jesus and he was set free from his drug addictions. He was set free miraculously from his uh, drink addictions. He was miraculously healed from uh, 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 an illness that rightfully should have killed him, actually. We have another photo of him. This is what he looks like today. He, he got involved in the church and he made friends with a dentist who said, I'm going to fix your teeth for you. And uh, this is actually a photo of Eddie in L.A. He traveled with a group of people to go to Skid Row in L.A. to share this message of what Jesus can do for you and to train other people to run Alpha. That's the difference Jesus can make in your life. Actually, he... he he put it like this to me uh, once. Um, in London, we, we used to run this uh, leadership conference at the Royal Albert Hall. And, uh, and the Queen of England has a box in the Royal Albert Hall. And if you want to use that box, you have to write to her and ask. So we, we wrote to her to ask if we could use the box. And she wrote back, or probably her secretary or someone in her team wrote back, and said, you can use the box and you put your most important people in the box. So what, the people we put in were the, were the ex-convicts, the former homeless, and the former um, uh, drug addicts and Eddie was one of those guys in there and he put it like this to me he said look a year ago I was sleeping outside this building on the vents to keep warm at night and now I'm seated in the royal box that's the difference that Jesus makes in your life the pollution is gone we can be set free the second thing we see is that the partition has been removed we can Come home, if you like. The root and result of sin was, an, uh, was a broken relationship with God. The result of the cross is that we can have our relationship with God back. The relationship for which you and I were created. See, on the cross, uh, it, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to him. God was in Christ. It, it wasn't just an innocent third party being punished on the cross. That would be barbaric. God came and he took the bad stuff so that we could be reconciled to him. It's as personal as that. St. Paul wrote this. He said, the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. You know, if you'd been the only person in the world to have sinned, God would have thought it was worth it to come and die so he could have a relationship with you. And finally, the penalty has been paid. It's a bit like this. Imagine that there were two friends, and they were the best of friends. They did everything together. They, they played together. They went to school together. They even went to university together. But after that, their lives took two very different directions. One uh, went to study law and then went to train to be a solicitor and then eventually to become a high court judge. The other descended into a life of petty crime. One day, eventually, the criminal was caught and brought to trial and ended up in front of his former friend, the now judge. Now, the judge had a dilemma. He loved his friend, but justice had to be done. And so what he did was he handed down the sentence. The sentence uh, and the penalty for the offence was an enormous fine. It was what he deserved. It was an enormous fine, way bigger than he could ever afford to pay. Then after handing the sentence down, the judge took off his robes and came down out of his chair, drew alongside his friend and wrote out a cheque covering the cost. He paid the penalty himself. That is what God has done for us in Christ. Of course, the, the illustration breaks down, partly due to dubious legal practices, but, but also because God's love is so greater than the love of a friend. And the offense is so much worse than could ever just be paid off financially. It, it costs Jesus his life, his life on a cross. But the picture is that the penalty has been paid. It's possible for us to be completely forgiven. To know that everything we have done has been forgiven. And when I first heard this, when I started to understand this, this transforms your life. It gives you a freedom and a confidence that I'd never known before. 
And it allows you to start to enjoy the relationship with God for which you were created. The verse we started with says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him. In other words, there is a response. There's something for us to do. And next week, we're going to look at the topic of faith uh, and, uh, and what faith is and how we can have faith. But you don't have to wait till next week to know that you are forgiven, to know that you have this relationship with God. This is a gift God gives. He never forces it, but he offers it to us. Uh, and we are, have to respond if we want to. Uh, and it's a gift offered in love. And so the way we respond is also in love. And uh, I, I just want to give anyone who wants now the opportunity as we finish to, to pray a prayer like the one Eddie prayed. Uh, you might not be living in a dumpster, but it's a prayer that all Christians pray a lot of the time. It's a simple prayer that says, thank you, God, that you love me. Thank you that you sent Jesus to die in my place. I'm sorry for the things that I do that are wrong, and I turn away from them, and I ask that you would come into my life. And, and what I want to do now to finish is I'm just going to pray that prayer. And uh, in the silence, if you want to, you can echo that in your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me and that you died for me. I'm sorry for the bad things in my life. If anything comes to mind, just ask for forgiveness. I turn away from all that I know that is wrong. And I put my trust in you for what you did in the cross. I ask that you would come into my life now by your Holy Spirit so that I can know that you are with me forever. Amen. Amen. Um, there should be a booklet on your tables called Why Jesus. And at the back of that, it has a very similar prayer to the one that Eddie prayed that I just did. And if you want to look at that more in the week, you feel free to take one of those. Uh, but we're going to have discussion now. We're going to have coffee, teas, uh, agree, disagree, uh, say what you think and have a really great rest of the evening.